the way in which the way in which the the um, Talmud lays out the history of our people as we near the year 6,000, the year the 6,000 year period is meant to parallel the six days of creation. God created the world in six days, rested on the seventh. So the Talmud learns from there that the world will exist for 6,000 years from Adam. And the 7,000 will be a time of, like, where every day is like Shabbos, right? Like the eternal, eternal Shabbos. So this every day uh, in the creation model is like a 1,000 years of our historic time. So if you sort of calculate that... Um, sort of calculates you know, uh, every thousand years as a 24 hour period let's say okay. so then every 42 years or so, every 42 and a half years or so is another hour on the cosmic clock like where we are right, because each, remember each day of creation as it's described in the Torah parallels a thousand year period, so every thousand years is like if you want to know what's a cosmic hour, you can divide it into 24. So it's about four, every 42 years, 42 and a half years or so, uh, is another hour on the cosmic clock. So where are we holding right now? What's the Jewish year on the, on the look on the calendar? 5775. 5775 out of 6,000. So we're holding Friday afternoon. 5750, 1990 was midday. And now we're 20 years later, so we're almost at 12.30. We're mid midday and a half. We're so that was, that was one year. 1990 was one year on the cosmic clock. Let's take it back a cosmic hour. 42 years before that is 1948. Anything special happen that year? I don't know. Something, something, uh, something happened. Right? Whatever. Right, okay. Yeah, some, right. Well, if we, uh, we know our math people. We know our history people. Whatever, you don't, we don't necessarily have to, to use it as a rule of thumb as to tra tracing back every 42 and a half years or whatever before, before that. But the idea is that every, every day in the creation model is meant as a part of a cosmic clock. So we're here, we're, we're, we're here Friday, Friday afternoon. Okay? The truth of the matter is that just like anything else, you know, on, on Friday afternoon, you're not supposed to wait until the sun actually goes down to start Shabbat. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to take on Shabbat a little bit early. It's a mitzvah, actually. To take on... What? To take, to, well, to actually accept Shabbos, to, to take it on earlier than, earlier than Shabbos comes in. It's a mitzvah. Right? Let alone the preparations for Shabbos and that if you, ha if you want to eat on Shabbos, you have to prepare on Shabbos and everyone's busy cooking Friday afternoon, all the preparations. What happens? What happens Friday afternoon in a Shabbos house? All the preparations start getting crazy. Everything starts getting fast. Right? Everyone wakes up, the morning comes. Monday through Thursday, it's just talk. You know, Sunday through Thursday, I should say, it's all talk, it's theory, it's, okay, who should we have as guests? And it's, uh, what kind of food should we have? What kind of menu? It's all sort of ethereal, right? Friday afternoon, you walk into a Shabbos observant house, there's hustle and bustle, there's, people are mopping, people are showering, people, the whole house is crazy. Everything speeds up. And so the same thing on our cosmic clock, the way that everything takes place and everything transpires, we're operating in this cosmic clock, and this cosmic speed up. You know, when Mashiach comes, one of the great things that we will be privy to is that all of nature, we will see the godliness in all of nature. Meaning we'll see how science, the deepest depths of science, will confirm the deepest teachings of Judaism, the, the teachings, the inner workings of Jewish mysticism will parallel what they find in science. And we see traces of that already taking place. So, as, as secular knowledge increases and as Jewish knowledge and proliferation increases, we see also a speed up. And as Mashiach gets closer, it only gets, only gets faster. You know something... You know what's very interesting is that the, 
the modern, the, when, when Europe got the idea, or started looking at the idea of the scientific method, it's a man by the name of Roger Bacon. Okay, so Roger Bacon, I, I don't know if was the name, Bacon, whatever, but uh, just saying that's his name. So he lived in the 1200s, okay? And that, that was the beginning of the, um, the sixth millennium, the, the year 5000 and on, the 5000s, right? We're in 775 years later. So in those years, that's when we reached another cosmic sort of uh, point where science and, and uh, religion sort of are coming on emerge. In the same era, you had a philosopher uh, named Thomas Aquinas. It's not a Jewish philosopher, but also he was, he, he was of the ideology that spirituality, it's like even in the non-Jewish world, the idea that spirituality and science should somehow converge, that they should, should overlap, they should be part of the same idea. After all, God made the universe and God created the Torah. They can't contradict each other. One is just, they're just different expressions of the same thing. And when Mashiach comes, that will be actualized in the most, in the most prominent and, and palatable way. So the Zohar actually makes a, an amazing prophecy. It's very rare that a Jewish text makes such a clear indication of what, what's, what's a common. So the Zohar says, just like Noah, Noah, in the story of Noah and the flood, that when he was 600 years old, the flood waters began. So he says also, excuse me, so the Zohar says as well, that in the sixth millennium, meaning the 5,000 year time, in the 600th year, just like in Noah experienced the flood, in the 600th year of the sixth millennium, meaning the year 5600, just like Noah experienced the flood, with the waters from below and the waters from ab above converging, so too says the Zohar that from that time there's going to be a flood. Not a flood of waters and not a flood that engulfs the world. After all, God promised He's never going to destroy the whole world again with flood. It's not going to be a flood of waters. It's going to be a flood of knowledge. And a flood that begins like a trickle and then becomes an unstoppable, unstoppable rampaging tsunami. So on the secular calendar, 5600 is around the time of 1840, where all sorts of revolutions are going on in the world. You have Industrial Revolution, it's just after the American Revolution, the French Revolution. The world was changing in mass. Interestingly enough, Newsweek magazine wrote in the year 2000, there was an article, that when did the modern era begin? 1820. So right around that time period. Even Newsweek magazine picked up on it. So the Zohar says around 5600, around that time, use that time as a gauge, that's when stuff's going to really start picking up. Both in science and in Torah. But we see that from then, the scientific discoveries have been astronomical. And as time progresses, and as each year goes on, things are moving faster and faster and faster. Think about how slowly things moved up until, let's say, even the year 1900. From the Garden of Eden until 1900, if a person wanted to go somewhere, they used horse and buggy. They used chariot. You could have taken someone out in a time machine from 3,000 years ago and stuck them in the 1700s or the 1800s, and they really wouldn't have that much culture shock. They really wouldn't have that much. A few different outfits maybe, a few different this one rules this one now, but overall culture shock? Not that big a difference. Take someone from 1950 into 2000. 50 years of the culture shock of their life. 
tell someone that they could talk to anyone around the world at any time on their pocket phone and see them. And it's free. Or two cents a minute, depending on which plan you get or whatever. Right? Send them a document. Right? At any time around the world, you could send a document, you can talk to them face to face on your portable cellular phone that you have unlimited data for, if you have the right plan. Right? From the Garden of Eden until 1900, people were again horse and buggy. Then 1903, Wright brothers come along. They make an airplane, right? An automobile becomes popular, right? Beginning of the 1900s, beginning of the 20th century. 60 years later, we're putting men on moon. Things are speeding up. Things are getting fast. From the Garden of Eden till the, the mid 1800s, you couldn't even. You wanted, to, you, wanted to, you wanted to express yourself? You wanted to send someone something? Snail mail, letter. That was the only... Then came, you know, telegraph, telegram. <coughs> all these things. And now at the instant, at, 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 the, at a faster than we can even think about getting something there, okay, yeah, send it to me, it's there. On your portable device. No need for fax machines anymore. No need for home computers anymore. You have everything you could ever want. The world's knowledge is to be your fingertips. Stuff's changing. Stuff's speeding up. It's Friday afternoon. Everything's speeding up. Thinking through the number of Torah, not that the sages that we have today are bigger and better and brighter than they ever were as sages, but think about how ubiquitous Torah has become. Before the 1800s, someone wanted to get their hands... How many books did people have? How, many, how much access did people have to learning? To Judaism? You had your rabbi in your town, okay, with the books that you had in your library. You know, traditionally, Jewish books were made to be large, right? Why are the editions of the Talmud and the Code of Jewish Law so large? Which is the big print? No. It's because several people were sharing them. We didn't have lots and lots of copies. Right? Look, traditionally, you see, see a volume of the Talmud, you see a volume of the Code of Jewish Law. It's large. Since those are so fundamental to Judaism. Okay, so when, when people came to the synagogue, you had ten men sitting around one book. You needed a big book so everyone could see. And everyone's sitting around, so you had to be even able to read it upside down. Now, person has access to any Torah class on any topic from any rabbi around the world at any moment on their cellular device as well. Torah is ubiquitous. It's been translated into almost every language under the sun. It's accessible anytime to anybody. So as knowledge both in secular Increases, it also increases in the Torah. And they go together. The Gona Vilna, and also more contemporarily, Lubavitcher Rebbe, said that as, that as technology increases, that all of those things are, are means and are signs that the timing is right. Because as technology increases, Information is able to be sent faster. Science and scientific discovery are expressions of what's going to be when Mashiach comes. Because there's always a parallel in Torah of what's happening in the, in the secular world as well. So on the good side of the code, we, had, we, had, we discussed a little earlier the kind of the tough things that are, that are coming, but also the good things as well. How many medical discoveries are made every single year? In fact, the medical books... The doctors say that by the time that they're getting ready to publish their book, it's become obsolete. Right? They have to rewrite it. Or change chapters or rewrite things. So things are changing so fast for the good. And the other way as well. There's such a, there's such a, a break, such a dichotomy when we look at the world. We oftentimes focus on the bad. And we oftentimes hear mostly about the bad. Why? Because bad sells. Right? Got to be a 24-hour news network. 
Right? There, there's not 24 hours of news to talk about. Well, we better make some stuff up then. Right? And since trouble sells and will make you turn in, right? We're not going to talk to you about the great job that all these kids did or that this doctor who saved this amount of people or this experiment that they're working on which is helping people or this charity work that this group did. Nah, who's going to watch that? People want your kids could be in danger. Tune in at 7. That's what people are looking for. And that's what sells. So that's what we get. And so we're bombarded by negativity when in reality, on the other side of the coin, there's just as much, if not more, positivity happening in the world. So whenever we hear about the world turning on its head for the negative, we have to know also that God creates everything. The book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Kaihelis, tells us God creates everything one opposite the other. That when the world has this amount of negativity in it, right on the other side of the coin is positivity as well.